Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present part three of my series on the selected gross pathology of the dog. And we're going to talk about the pathology of the hemolymphatic system. But before we do that, I want to thank all my friends and colleagues who have contributed to this lecture on the dog over the years through the generous donation of their images, either directly or through online collections. And so let's get started. Now in these lectures, I don't delve too deeply into clinical pathology, and I'll leave that for people who know much more about that than I do. But I can tell you this is the yellowest dog that I've ever seen. This is what we see in dogs with immune-mediated hemolytic anemia. These are type 2 reactions which are mediated by antibody and complement. And sometimes these dogs don't turn very yellow because they have extravascular hemolysis, which is mediated generally by the accumulation of IgG on the red blood cells. And they're taken out of circulation primarily in the spleen and the liver, and the dogs will have very big spleens, and their hematocrits will go down very slowly. When you see a dog that is this ictric, it probably has a slightly different type of immune-mediated hemolytic anemia where IgM is what accumulates on the red blood cells. It's the autoantibody. And then the complete complement cascade will form on the RBC and you'll get widespread hemolysis within the blood vessels. These animals go down precipitously. I had my own dog which passed away from this and, and in the space of two days she went from a 50 hematocrit down to an 8. Absolutely amazing. Now when we talk about immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, you see concurrent thrombocytopenia in about 60 percent. These are often uh, very unrewarding in terms of trying to figure out what caused it because they may be associated with various drugs or vaccines. They may be associated with infectious agents such as rickettsia. Even something like bee stings may precipitate a hemolytic event. Whereas antibody formation may deplete platelets in these animals, there's often widespread hemorrhages as well, which further depletes platelet levels. And then another thing to look for, because a lot of these dogs have been treated either in the short term or in the long term, is look for lesions associated with chronic steroid administration. Chronic cases may be positive on Coombs testing. And it's interesting because it takes 500 molecules of IgG to cause a positive Coombs test, but only takes 24 to 32 to shorten the erythrocyte lifespan. In chronic cases, you may see enlargement of the spleen and the liver, and you may see a hyperplastic bone marrow as well. So these cases, there's a lot to look for, but in terms of finding a cause, they're often very unrewarding. Now, one of the things that I say over and over again in these lectures is when you see hemorrhage, think necrosis, because there are very few truly hemorrhagic diseases. But this is a great case of extensive hemorrhage within the chest, there is suffusive hemorrhage on the surface of the stomach, and this is one of those hemorrhagic only diseases. This, as you can imagine from the inset right here, is rodenticide poisoning. This is a disease of progress. Back when I started practice many, many years ago, we were dealing with warfarin baits, and the mice and rats had to go back multiple times because warfarin wasn't the most powerful anticoagulant. But because uh, everything progresses over time, today's third generation rodenticides, anticoagulant rodenticides like Brodificum, only need one feeding. The mechanism of action of these rodenticides is that they antagonize vitamin K, which is required for the synthesis of a number of coagulation factors, including 2, 7, 9, and 10. And the affected animals can't convert prothrombin into thrombin. 
and today's rodenticides are far more longer lasting than those of the past. They can last up to 21 days. It usually takes a couple of days to deplete the animal's uh, stores of vitamin K before you start to see bleeding. And when it happens, it can be absolutely massive. As you see the hemorrhage in the chest, and as we said before, there will be hemorrhages on multiple organs. You may have hemorrhages into the joint spaces. Um, a lot of veterinarians want to give corticosteroids uh, to, to uh, decrease some of this, but that's actually uh, worsen, it's going to worsen the thrombotic state. As uh, we've seen in a number of lectures, corticosteroids inhibit tissue plasminogen activators and put the animal into a, an even worse bleeding state. Uh, a number of other drugs, when they're given, they may also worsen the problem by displacing anticoagulants, which are bound to serum proteins. Of all of the factors, uh, factor 7 has the shortest half-life, about 4 to 6 hours. So you will probably see signs first with an elevated PTT or prothrombin time. And factor 9 doesn't last that much longer, maybe about twice. So an elevated uh, activated prothrombin time will generally follow. Prothrombin itself has about a 40-hour half-life. Um, there aren't a lot of things that are going to give you this picture of bleeding all over. Uh, rodenticides are number one. There are some snake venoms uh, of the pit vipers that will cause massive uh, bleeding tendencies in infected animals. You're also going to see lysis of the glomeruli. There's some other histologic lesions that may help you differentiate the two. And of course, the animal that's bit by a rattlesnake or one of the other will have a large swelling where it's bitten, which you don't see with rodenticide. Obviously, you always want to go in and, and it takes a while for these rat bait pellets to break down. They're a bright teal or aquamarine color. And so if you see that in the stomach, um, obviously you're going to think about uh, rodenticide intoxication. Here's another picture of rodenticide intoxication. Certainly not as dramatic as the first one, but I really like this picture because we're looking at the thymus and you can see all these areas of hemorrhage, but, but it's a wonderful anatomic gross picture of the thymus and you can see the lobules and the leaflets of the thymus as well. The thymus is a very common spot for agonal hemorrhages um, so we can see hemorrhages here in a wide range of uh, different diseases uh, including heat stroke or any type of, uh, uh, of disease where the animal uh, dies in a, a somewhat agitated state. And you'll also see hemorrhages in the serosa of a number of organs. You may see it on the uh, epicardium or within the myocardium as well. But just a really beautiful picture of the thymus here. Now here's an older picture uh, from a dog and we can see a lot of hemorrhage in the thymus and in the chest and if you told me that this was rodenticide poisoning grossly I probably couldn't disagree with you but this is a condition that um, this type of thymic hemorrhage or hemorrhage in the chest may be seen um, to blunt as a result of blunt trauma to the chest especially in deep chested breeds um, who hit their chest very hard. They may be jumping out of the back of a pickup truck. We've seen this a number of times in uh, military working dogs back in the day where they used, to, they used to ride loose in the truck and they would jump out and whack their chest. And the blood vessels of the thymus tend to be a little bit of weak, weak and rarely you can get this severe hemorrhage there. As we're talking about the thymus, the dog will occasionally have neoplasms of the thymus. Thymomas um, are not as common in the dog as they are in other species such as goats or even cats. They can be uh, very silent and not show signs until they take up a significant portion of the, the chest. While they are benign tumors, they will displace organs, they also will fill up the chest. And the aspiration of these I found because 
one of my dogs uh, died of thymoma, is very unrewarding because they're very cystic, they're very bloody, and it's very difficult to get good tissue. It's not a difficult histologic diagnosis. Remember, there are basically two different things that compose the thymus. You have the epithelium of the thymus and you have lymphocytes. So you can have two types of tumors there. You can get a thymic lymphoma, which is a neoplasm of the T-cells in the thymus, very different than the thymoma, which is a neoplasm of the epithelial portion. So I said before, sticking needles in here, you often just get blood back. And it can be a, a trying cytologic diagnosis. And I put a picture of, of my own dog in here. She was a big German shepherd. and She was always sort of heavy and not, never much of an athlete. And... Uh, it was so silent, and by the time we realized that there was something wrong, because she was a lay-around kind of dog, uh, this neoplasm had essentially taken up almost every square inch of available real estate in her chest. Okay, well, let's leave the thymus. Uh, let's quickly hit the tonsils, another lymphoid organ. Um, and the tonsils are great for sampling uh, the gastrointestinal environment. They don't do much, they don't mount any immune responses, but they do get inflamed. There are a number of agents, especially canine adenovirus or infectious canine hepatitis, which will use the tonsils as a portal of entry. Viruses and various bacteria like strep canis may use that in the dog, but ICH is a good one where you get big engorged tonsils and multifocal areas of necrosis. We get into other species, uh, especially pigs, there's a lot of different agents which like to enter through the tonsils. But you don't see a lot of pathology associated with the tonsils in the dog. One of the few things that you will see is neoplasia of the tonsil. And the tonsil, like the thymus, is a very uh, non-complex. It's a very simple organ. You have lymphoid tissue, you have some squamous epithelium, and you have blood vessels. So about the only three types of neoplasms that you're going to see in the dog are lymphomas, squamous cell carcinoma, and the rare hemangiosarcoma because they arise there. The tonsils have no afferent lymphatics. Okay, so there are no lymphatics going to the tonsils. That's why they don't mount much of a, uh, a immune response. They're simply uh, sampling and taking antigens back to, for processing. Um, when you see neoplasms on both sides of the tonsils, bilateral, this is generally lymphoma. As I said before, no afferent lymphatics. And the other thing that that means is that there are no neoplasms that metastasize to the tonsil. So if you see a neoplasm in the tonsil, it pretty much had to arise there. If it's bilateral, it's probably going to be a lymphoma. Um, there is a, another potential for growths in the tonsil. So we said before, here's one that is uh, sort of, it's unilateral. It is proliferative. This is a squamous cell carcinoma. And occasionally you will see inflammatory polyps of the tonsil where the normal tonsil just gets really, really huge. And that's called inflammatory polyps. But um, those are extremely rare and not the tonsil neoplasia is common at all. But uh, I'm thinking tumors first when we see, uh, when we see enlargement of the tonsil. Okay, let's talk about pathology of the spleen. And uh, the spleen, when engorged, is susceptible to trauma. You could have a splenic rupture, and occasionally you'll get trauma that will ap actually tear the spleen in two. And it's amazing how many of these are repaired. If the animal gets hit by a car or something, how many of these will be plugged up by the omentum? That's one of the one of the many different functions of the omentum besides being a lymphoid organ on its own. Um, but the sort of fatty nature of the omentum is great for plugging these torn spleens. And what you end up with is you get a lot of splenic parenchyma that, that uh, that comes out 
and it just sort of takes root in the omentum or the mesentery. These are known as accessory spleens. They're small functional spleens, and, and they are a good hint that there has been focal splenic trauma or rupture and, uh, and healing after that. Now remember that the spleen is a, uh, a very a, an organ which is capable of rapid physiologic and dynamic change. Okay, it becomes congested, it becomes big. You can have uh, hyperplasia of various components, including the lymphoid tissue and uh, even the hematopoietic tissue, which exists in the spleen. And so it grows and shrinks and grows and shrinks. And something that we'll see, which is an incidental finding, um, there's a great picture by Dr. John King, which shows the spleen of a very old dog. And over time, this organ, which may double or triple the size in uh, the space of a couple hours and then goes back, eventually the, the stroma will sort of wear out and it loses elasticity. And it will swell, but it is, the smooth muscle um, is unable in these old spleens to squeeze all of the blood back out. So you'll see these focal areas of congestion in old spleens. And, and don't interpret these grossly um, as hemangiosarcoma or something else. Always have this idea in the back of your head that old spleens, after a lifetime of getting big and getting small again, may not be able to squeeze that blood back out that they, as they could in, in the dog in its shoes. So, uh, Dr. King used to call this unequal expulsion of blood in the spleen. I don't have a better name for it. Just realize that it does happen that not every nodule, especially the dark red bloody ones, um, are hematomas or cancer. Something else that you will see on a fairly regular basis in the spleens of dogs as a result of this dynamic change is mineralization um, of the splenic capsule. You can see it most commonly at the edges. Sometimes you'll see it uh, following the trabeculae of the spleen. And these are known as siderotic plaques, or some people call them gamma gandhi bodies. But I like the term siderotic plaque. Um, it tells you a little bit about what's going on. It's a combination of fibrous connective tissue, iron often in the form of uh, uh, either hematoidin or uh, hemosiderin, the same thing, but hemosiderin is within macrophages. It's been broken down a little farther. And mineralization, very common in older dogs. And, and what happens is the spleen stretches, and then it, it ruptures a little bit of blood vessel. You have some hemorrhage. When it shrinks back down, body cleans up that hemorrhage, and you may end up in certain areas with these siderotic plaques. Now we move on to one of the most confusing uh, parts of the spleen, and that is splenic nodules. Now when I see a raised area on a spleen, there are a couple things that I want to think about. And it's very difficult to tell one from the other. This could be an area of unequal expulsion of blood, but those generally involve the margins. They don't often involve the center of the spleen. Okay, this could be a splenic infarct, which we can see in animals with marked splenomegaly. When you put enough cells in there, especially inflammatory cells, the blood supply of the spleen is tenuous to start with. It's not well formed. Blood sort of has to percolate. And if we throw a lot of inflammatory cells in there, or we throw a lot of neoplastic cells in the case of lymphoma, the blood doesn't percolate well. Those spleens are prone to infarct. The fact that all of their arteries are end arteries as well, um, or if you thrombose the splenic vein and you can't get blood out, infarctions are pretty common. Um, but most commonly, these represent splenic hematomas, areas of rupture, once again, of that tenuous uh, blood supply. They're often seen in association with nodules of hyperplasia or splenic hematomas, and they can be absolutely massive, and they can ma mask what actually is causing them, whether it's a splenic nodule or a hemangiosarcoma. So one good thing 
to remember is that whenever you see a splenic nodule, you take one section per centimeter. Okay, if you have a 10 centimeter nodule and you just take one section, it's a very good chance you're never going to see what caused that. And all you're going to get is a lot of fibrin and hemorrhage and hemosiderin. So here at the JPC, we take one section per centimeter. Sometimes you get these 20 or 30 centimeter nodules, these splints that look like almost like basketballs. And you just take as many sections in hope of finding something that is not hematoma and is also viable. A lot of times if you do see some tissue, it's necrotic because there is no blood supply here. So it's two things you're looking for. You're looking for actual tissue and then you're looking for viable tissue. Now, splenic hematomas are confusing. Another thing that's been very confusing over the years are nodules of hyperplasia in the spleen. You can have uh, nodules of hyperplasia of areas of the red pulp where you'll see a lot of extra hematopoietic cells including megakaryocytes. It's often associated with congestion. Um, another very common finding in the spleen of old dogs are lymphoid nodules or nodules of lymphoid tissue which have undergone a several different classifications since the 1990s. One of the seminal papers uh, was written by uh, Dr. Bill Spangler back in the early 90s, where he classified these as uh, fibrohistiocytic nodules and graded them out and said, okay, um, those that have uh, a large number of lymphocytes have a good survival rate. Those that have a large number of, of stromal cells probably have a poor uh, survival rate, much less. And over the years, people have looked at that paper and they've resampled these and they've gone through a number of other classifications. And Dr. Peter Moore in the 2000s looked at these and said, okay, I think I can reclassify a lot of these as lymphomas. I can reclassify some as splenic sarcoma and I can reclassify some as histiocytic sarcoma. And so the term fibrohistiocytic nodule and the grades one through three has pretty much disappeared. Um, at the JPC, we use the term uh, lymphoid nodules of lymphoid hyperplasia or nodules of white pulp hyperplasia and complex nodules of hyperplasia for those that have a, uh, uh, a large stromal component. That is, after we have sorted out by immunohistochemistry those that are actually lymphoma, those that may be histiocytic sarcomas, and of course the stromal sarcomas, which are sarcomas of the smooth muscle and the fibroblasts and, and the stroma that lives in there, which also tend to have a poor survival rate. So first split is neoplasm, hemangiosarcoma, lymphoma, etc., versus inflammatory nodule, and then we will subclass the inflammatory nodule into red versus white pulp, and then uh, sort of simple versus complex lymphoid hyperplasia. It works for us. Here's a great picture of a complex nodule of lymphoid hyperplasia. Okay, most of this is going to be um, large, uh, extremely large splenic follicles, a lot of lymphocytes, and then there is a prominent uh, spindle cell component which may not be distributed equally through the entire thing. You could look at this and say, hey, that looks just like that uh, nodule of uh, lymphoid hyperplasia. And grossly, it does. Uh, in this particular one, there are multiple nodules, which makes you want to think about uh, splenic neoplasia. This actually is hemangiosarcoma. Now, when you look at that, you say, well, that, that's awful white. Most of the splenic hemangio sarcomas I see look a little more like this. They're reddish nodules, the spleen is ruptured, and we have a spillage of this tumor into the adjacent mesentery. And there's a great hemangiosarcoma, but the gross appearance of hemangiosarcoma is based on whether those 
neoplastic endothelial cells are packed in really tight where it's going to have a whitish firm appearance or whether they're sort of flat and loose and they're making some uh, some blood channels where it's going to be a little bit more of a hemorrhagic appearance. Splenic hemangiosarcomas, uh, the literature that uh, uh, that says that uh, if it's confined to the spleen, there's a 50% survival rate, I think is skewed incorrectly. Uh, I have had many dogs in my life, and, and they've died of everything. And we had uh, a dog that had a splenic hemangiosarcoma, and we took it to surgery, and the surgeon almost guaranteed us that there was no, uh, it was all confined to the spleen. There was no tumor in the abdomen. And three months later, that dog died with hemangiosarcoma everywhere. So I'm not a huge believer in, you know, saying hey, we got it before it spread because I think there's, in these particular uh, tumors, these are tumors of endothelial cells, which are normal components of any organ. They tend to be friable. They tend to get into the bloodstream very easily. And I think they can set up shop wherever you want so or wherever they want. So uh, I think that at the time of of surgery, unfortunately, you have a lot of micrometastases that maybe the surgeon can't see. Um, if he was or she was a pathologist, the incision would be much larger and probably get a much better view of what's going on. So, splenic hemangiosarcoma, we've talked about it many times. A uh, disease of big dogs. It is a, uh, it, the spleen is one of the three main sites for it to rise in the dog, the spleen, the liver, and the right atrium, and you can often find it in multiple organs at the same time. Now these animals, when they rupture, uh, when you rupture the spleen by neoplasia, I think hemoperitoneum is a, a big presenting sign, it's a big cause of death, and, and a great lesion if you look for it in these animals that exsanguinate um, is hemorrhage within the diaphragm. And this is a, a lesion that Dr. King pointed out to me many, many years ago. And I've only seen it in animals that exsanguinate. You can see it in animals that have recently been spayed and the pedicle has slipped off and they've exsanguinated. But I don't know why it happens, but look for it. Hemorrhage within the body of the diaphragm um, as a clue to exsanguination in the dog. Okay, big white nodules in the dog. Well, 57% of cases of lymphoma in the dog have splenic involvement. I tend to think my opinion, once again, it has to do with lymphocytes being a normal integral part of the, uh, of the spleen. Spleens, you almost never see uh, uh, a lot of other tumors, like from the mammary gland or whatever, they're very good at catching them and destroying them. They say, ah, mammary tissue, not supposed to be here, and they may destroy it. Um, lymphoid tissue, blood vessels, that's always there, and they're like, oh, okay, you belong here. So 57% of dog cases of lymphoma splenic involvement, about 43% uh, in cats. But it's pretty, the resident... Uh, uh, macrophage population of spleen is pretty good for catching other stuff. You will see it though in some really heart carcinomas, neuroendocrine tumors, etc. But uh, the spleen can manifest two different ways with lymphoma. You can get these big white nodules, or you can also get this diffuse enlargement of the spleen. Okay, where instead of being big nodules, diffusely spread out through the spleen. It brings up um, a lot of people talk about uh, terms I hate, like blackberry jam spleens and raspberry jam spleens. I prefer the term bloody versus meaty. So when you have a very large spleen and you cut into it, does blood run out all over the table or is it a fairly clean cut because that, that spleen is firm? And I think that gives you a good initial idea of some rule outs for this. Um, bloody spleens are full of blood um, often have significant components of congestion and you'll see that with things like barbiturates or other forms of anesthesia. Um, torsion or some types of 
uh, physiologic hyperemia that you might see in hemolytic anemia. Those tend to be very bloody. The meaty spleens, I'm thinking about neoplasia, granulomas disease, where you have an increase in the resident population of macrophages. You can also see that with sepsis as well. Long-standing sepsis will give you a very meaty spleen. And then, of course, the very rare cases of diffuse splenic amyloid. And we talked about lymphoma. This is a great picture um, by Dr. Laura O'Brien of Texas A&M. It's our last picture in this series. It is a bone marrow. When we think about bone marrow, we think about a number of neoplasms, uh, including lymphoma, including multiple myeloma, which we're going to cover when we get to the section on orthopedic uh, pathology. And then this tumor, which always should be a a rule out in your mind when you're thinking lymphoma about maybe 5% of those may be histiocytic sarcoma. This is a great picture of one in the bone marrow. Histiocytic sarcoma, always make sure a lot of times histologically these cells are going to be large. They'll have bizarre nuclei, but not all the time. And so whenever I'm thinking lymphoma, I'm pretty much always thinking uh, could this be histiocytic sarcoma? And I often will combine a couple of macrophage markers like IBA1 um, with my lymphoma immuno. So don't sleep on histiocytic sarcoma. Um, there are a lot more cases in the dog that we probably pick up, especially if we're making diagnoses based on H&E slides. Okay, well that sort of covers, I hope it at least partially covers the hemolymphatic system of the dog. Remember, this is selected gross pathology, not gross pathology of the dog. But I hope you enjoyed it anyhow. I hope you come back for more of these lectures on the dog or any of the other species or organ systems that you can find available on the Foundation's YouTube channel and on the JPC's uh, video library. I wish you all good health. I wish that you have a fantastic day and that you'll come back next time when we're going to start the gastrointestinal system of the dog. Take care, everyone.